then let's get started with Trump's latest decision to have Senator Wentz as his vice president. What does it mean when it comes to the foreign policy of the United States? Well, I guess the possible positive is it seems like he wants to stop funding Ukraine. Um, he thinks that's a lost cause. Um, which Trump seems to think so as well. So maybe that's a positive. And I only say maybe because, you know, Trump said positive things about Russia in 2016, and then he really didn't do anything positive towards Russia. So it's hard to take these guys at their word, but maybe that's a bright spot. In terms of Gaza and the Palestinians and the Middle East, I think it spells trouble for them. I think Vance is, uh, you know, a diehard Zionist. He's already said, you know, they have to be tougher on Iran. Seems like he may even want a war with Iran. So in terms of that, not good. And in terms of China, not good. I mean, a lot of people have said, look, you know, it's kind of pick your poison. The Democrats want Russia and uh, the Republicans really want to go after China. So, I mean, I wish we had a choice here um, of a peace candidate, but we don't have one. We have a choice between wars. <laughs> Which war do you want? Uh, and in terms of the, the war on Gaza, it seems like it doesn't matter who, who you vote for, Trump or Biden, you're going to get that war. So it's it's not good. It's not good at all. Actually, you do have a chance to vote for Jill Stein. <laughs> and I will. Believe me, I will. And a lot of people will. But the truth is, you know, she might get 1% of the vote, 2% maybe. Um, that's just a reality. But yes, it's good that we can vote for her. I will vote for her. But we have a duopoly, right? We have a, really a two-party system that's pretty um, entrenched. Unfortunately, um, like uh, Jill Stein won't even get on all the ballots. In fact, I think she did not get on the New York ballot, you know, which has so many electoral votes and probably won't get on the California ballot, which is very hard to get on. So that means that, you know, she's in the end, even if everyone who wanted to vote for her does, and, you know, she doesn't have a chance is the truth. Yeah. You talk about the conflict in Ukraine and how maybe Trump wants to bring an end to this conflict. So recently you were in Russia, if I'm not mistaken. In Lugansk, yes. Yeah. How did you sure. find the situation there and how do you see the current face of the conflict in Ukraine? Well, I have a few observations. In terms of Russia, kind of proper, for lack of a better word, you know, I was in Moscow and, and Moscow is normal, seems normal. People don't seem impacted by the war much. But, you know, while I was there, there were, you know, uh, Belgorod continues to get hit constantly. There were some terrorist attacks within the heartland of Russia. You know, whether the West is behind that, we don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. In terms of Lugansk, uh, where we were at, we stayed within the cities, including, you know, Lugansk City. Um, and those are, you know, mostly okay. You know, there are definitely buildings that have been shelled by Ukraine recently, but Lugansk is not getting, you know, hit like, for example, Donetsk is. We did not go to the front line of Lugansk though, because that, that was very hot while we were there. In fact, it was possible we weren't even going to get to Lugansk at all because of, because of fighting. So, um, the point is the war is still raging in uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And again, it is bleeding into the Russian heartland with some of these terrorist attacks. 
certainly with the attacks on Belgorod. And then, of course, you have these attacks on Crimea, which, again, are pretty much terrorist attacks. There was the attack that uh, hit the beachgoers in uh, Sevastopol and killed some children. You know, so the war there is real. You know, in a way, again, the, the United States has never had to face a war. You know, we've, we've, we've been hit by, you know, kind of terrorist attacks, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, which are bad, but, you know, they're not sustained in any kind of way. But Russia's now starting to feel those sorts of sustained attacks from the collective West. Yeah. But do you find it that NATO is getting to the point that the conflict is not affordable for them or they don't have any sort of chance as long as we have Biden in office and the Biden administration running NATO. Yeah, it seems like the U.S. under Biden will continue to push this war. That's very clear. And while you have starting to see Europe fray a bit with the left winning in France, of course, you have Hungary and Slovakia wanting peace with Russia. Those are all good things. Um, I think in Great Britain, the vote for Labour was a vote, in some ways, for peace, though I don't think Labour is going to give it to them, again, in the same way that the Democrats won't give us peace. But you're seeing the will of the Europeans moving, certainly, against the war. And that's a positive development. Mm -hmm. How did you find this failed assassination of Donald Trump? It was a little guy who came out of nowhere just shooting at Donald Trump. How did you find it? Well, I want to be very measured in my response because, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories flying. But what, what I will say is that there are a lot of troubling facts around that attempt. There are huge questions as to how that young man got up to a roof that was within the line of sight of Donald Trump. In fact, it turns out that he was on top of Secret Service people that were in that building. And, of course, the first thing the Secret Service should do, and other law enforcement, because there were other law enforcement there, when you have an event with a important dignitary or or president or former president like Trump, is to make sure that a, that 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 type of building is sealed off, that no one can grab a ladder and climb up with a, a an automatic rifle and shoot at someone like Trump. But that is exactly what happened. So there was a huge failure there. I mean, everyone is saying that. Minimally, there was incredible negligence. And of course, you had people, you had the redheaded guy on BBC who said, you know, he was in the crowd, he saw the gunman, he yelled at the police, he said, there's a gunman on the roof, others were saying there's a gunman, and nothing was done. Apparently, there was a police, at least one story I read, a police officer did go up there, and the guy pointed a gun at the police officer, and he for lack of a better word, he chickened out and he just climbed down without engaging with that shooter. But again, why did, did he tell someone the guy was up there? So the long and short of it is there's some uneasy feeling people have questions as to was he allowed to get up there? Was he allowed to take a shot? And I guess... I'd like to think we will know the truth about that in the fullness of time, but we still don't know the facts around the Kennedy assassination, right? So um, we'll see. But look, there will be a congressional investigation about this. The heads will definitely roll. I mean, you will see some big uh, leaders lose their jobs over this. Maybe the head of the Secret Service, for example, because the failures were, were incredible. Um, again, bordering, certainly negligent, bordering on reckless and knowing. So we'll see. Um, and yeah, we don't know much about that 
young man. He's like 20 years old. I mean, how much could he even know about him? Um, whether he acted alone, whether he had help, I hope we find out. Is Donald Trump going to benefit from this assassination, this failed assassination in 2024? I think so. Um, he looks strong. You know, he came out, he told his Secret Service people to wait, and then he, you know, raised his fist. And there's that a couple iconic photos of him raising his fist. I think Americans eat that stuff up. I mean... And you compare that to Trump to Biden, who can't put two sentences together. I think it has to help Trump. I think it has to help Trump. So, um, how much I don't know. I mean, we'll get get them new voters. Tough to say, but it'll certainly firm up his base in a big way. Yeah. And. Do you think that this would bring those part of the Republican Party who are in favor of Romney, Liz Cheney, and these people who are not totally in line with Donald Trump, is that going to help Donald Trump to bring those voters to his campaign? I think it might, especially depending on how he reacts to it. Apparently, he's changing his speech for the uh, you know Republican National Committee because of the attempt. He's going to be more conciliatory. He's going to talk about national unity, and that may help him. That you know that is as much as the attempt might help him. The response will be critical to him, and I think that if he goes that way and tamps down on his rhetoric. Uh, that will probably help him with more moderate Republicans, certainly, yes. The other dimension of the Trump administration, if he wins, would be the, their policy in Gaza. Right now, how do you find the situation in Gaza? It's horrifying. It's getting worse by the day. Um, I am very saddened by it. I have friends there I'm in touch with. One of my friends, her name's Ola, she's moved several times in the last week to avoid bombardment. Can you imagine living like that? I mean, you're, you're literally not living anywhere. You're literally just running. And can you imagine if you had children or, or parents or grandparents and doing that? And there's the food is 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 all but run out. The water is run out. Famine is setting in. I mean, it is. It, you know, they keep saying, "Oh, they're on the verge of famine." No, they've they they they've crossed the Rubicon into famine. And so you have that Lancet report, for example, saying 186,000 people have been killed, at least, in Gaza. And that's just going to go up by the tens of thousands over the next days and weeks, because minimally because of the famine, but also Israel's becoming even worse. I mean, there was a horrible massacre several days ago um, in which they killed at least 90 people in a, a makeshift refugee camp which was supposed to be a safe zone. I mean, Israel's firing at will at everyone and anyone, and they, they just seem to be out of control, I think is a good word. In fact, there's this story that was published, I think by, is it 972 Plus magazine, which is an Israeli magazine, Saying, you know, quoting soldiers say they're just, you know, the rules of, of engagement are they can shoot at anyone at any time for any reason or no reason. And they're just shooting people at times because they're bored. You know, so this is terrible. I mean, uh, and there's no end in sight. You know, there doesn't seem to be a ceasefire on the horizon. The press is losing interest. Even it appears the protests are not what they were, you know, um, those are flagging a bit. So there's nothing to stop Israel. Um, 
so I'm very sad by very depressed even by by it. And 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 to see this happening is just terrible. If you were to pick one of these two conclusions out of the conflict in Gaza, on one side we can say some some one can argue that Israel is winning, is try is is still trying to win the conflict in Gaza. That's why they are killing more and more people. And the other argument would be they're losing and they're losing badly. That's why they're so desperate. They don't know what to do. They couldn't kill Hamas. They couldn't remove Hamas. Right now, they they want to pick a fight with Hezbollah because they know that they have failed in Gaza. Well, which one do you pick? I think in many ways, they are the, the IDF, in fact, wants a ceasefire because they do think they're losing. They're afraid that if they get deeper into a war with Hezbollah, they really could lose everything. Um, so yes, there's no doubt that Israel is losing militarily. But they're not losing quick enough to save Gaza. And that is to say, in the short term, Gaza is being destroyed. And the people there are being destroyed. And in the end, Israel may lose this thing. But again, I don't think necessarily in time for Gaza to be saved. And that's the tragedy. Um, what will be left for those people? And how many Gazans will even be left? I mean, that's a terrible thing to think about. So that figure I gave, the Lancet report, 186,000, which again, I think is climbing every day. Already at 186,000, you're talking about 8% of the, the, the population of Gaza. It's going to quickly go up to 10%, 15, 20. I mean, it's, 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 the numbers are horrible. And of course, the infrastructure is gone. They've wiped out the infrastructure. They're saying it'll take decades just to remove the rubble, much less to be able to do new construction. So... I think Zionism, yes, is is going to fail. It will lose. Israel will, will lose. Uh, but the people of Gaza may lose also in the process, is the truth of it. With this article that you've mentioned in the Lancet, that 186,000 people were killed in this conflict so far, at least, it seems Israel is getting to the point that says, they're already calling this a genocide. Let's do the job. Let's finish the job. Let's kill as much as possible. Do you think that they're thinking this way right now? I think there is something to that. I think they realize, look, we've lost world opinion. Our economy's in the tank. Uh, we're losing this militarily. So, yes, we might as well go and just finish the job. And finishing the job is wiping out as many Palestinians as they can. And their hope is they will take over all of Gaza and then the West Bank. They'll have their dream of it controlling all the land from the river to the sea. And yes, they would have paid, been paid a, a huge price for that. But then they, they probably think maybe if they bide their time, people will forget and forgive. Um, so yes, I think in some ways they may not feel an incentive to stop now because they've already gone too far. And when you go too far, sometimes you feel like, okay, well, there's nothing, there's no reason to stop, you know. Yeah. If they go fighting Hezbollah, in your opinion, do you consider any sort of chance of winning against Hezbollah? No, I think that that's and that's why they have not pulled the trigger on fully attacking Beirut. They're engaged with Hezbollah now. I mean, they have been since the beginning. But Hezbollah itself is not, they, they want 
to, they will hold back all, you know, they will not fully attack Israel unless Israel fully attacks Lebanon. And Lebanon or Israel has, has held off on doing that because they know if they really have a full blown on war with Hezbollah, they will lose. Especially now, because they've already been weakened so greatly. Apparently, they're running out of ammunition. They're running out of reservists. You know, reservists are being recycled through Gaza. They're, you know, uh, they're suffering a lot of casualties, a lot of mental health issues. So they've already been weakened greatly. And to now go after Hezbollah in a full-blown way, I mean, they would lose big time. Recently, I talked with a journalist in Lebanon. He said that this conflict is bringing Shia and Sunni together. Seems that the Muslim world is getting united behind Gaza. Do you think that's the case right now? I think the Muslim people are yes, and I and, and you know the whole Shia Sunni conflict is a manufactured conflict to begin with, right by the West. So it's not surprising that the Muslims are overcoming that to come together to support Palestine. But that's the people. The governments haven't quite gotten there, right? Egypt is still really acting in ways that are helping Israel at this point, um, even to the point of hurting themselves, right? Israel's violated the... Uh, Camp David Accords by taking over that, what is it, the Philadelphia Corridor um, in Gaza. That They're not supposed to do that under the peace accords with Egypt, but they've done it. They've shut down the border with Egypt entirely. This could be a cause for war. I mean, this could be a cause for Egypt to say the Camp David Accords are done We're because you violated it. Um, but they haven't done that. And a number of Gulf states are still, you know, economically supporting Israel. Um, Turkey, ha you know, is still, they, they, they're definitely ratcheting back support for Israel and economic ties and all that. But they still haven't fully broken, um, you know, off ties with Israel. So, again, the, the people are firm. In, in the camp of Gaza, but the governments are not. The governments don't represent the people in that way. And some of those governments may fall over this, particularly the one in Egypt. It seems that the conflict has changed the face of the Middle East right now. We, when we see Erdogan wants to talk with Bashar al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad invited to the Arab League, Arab League just dropping the designation of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization and these are huge changes that are happening right now and do you still believe that the governments in the Middle East don't understand what's really going on in Gaza? I think they understand and I don't think they like it. The problem is a number of the governments are still very beholden to the West economically again particularly uh, Egypt and Jordan. I didn't even mention Jordan, but both of them are very highly dependent on aid from the United States. And uh, the governments, as they are, are afraid to risk that aid to really support Gaza in a, in a full-throated manner. Um, again, Jordan has really played a treacherous role in all this. Um even helping intercept, you know, missiles from Iran when, when it was targeting Israel and um, certainly allowing oil and other supplies into Israel across the uh, King Hussein Bridge. I witnessed that when I was in the West Bank in, in December. And all, you know, there were oil trucks lined up going into Israel. They all had Arabic lettering on them, you know. So the governments understand they're afraid of their own people. They're afraid that, that this will lead the people to overthrow them, again, in countries like Egypt and 
in Jordan. Um, but they feel they have a lot to lose economically from fully supporting Gaza. And we know that if Donald Trump wins in 2024, it seems that the policy would be just getting more radical toward China. And if you look at the NATO summit, they have invited Australia, New Zealand, and Japan and South Korea in order to send a message to China. They have been talking about that China is because of China that Russia is doing well in the conflict, in the war in Ukraine. And we have in Philippines, political, politically they're doing sending military and Taiwan as well. How do you see the policy of the Trump administration toward China? He was talking, he was recently, two months ago, he was talking about China. He said he not, he's not thinking of doing anything militarily, but everything as a as an economic war toward China. But we know that people like Senator Rance, they're totally aggressive toward China. How do you see, are we gonna have some sort of escalations between between China and the United States if Trump wins militarily? I mean, we could again, and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it's important not to just focus on the personalities of people like Trump and Biden. There, there are very strong elements in the ruling class that want that war, that want a World War III, because capitalism, Western capitalism is failing. And I think we haven't seen the worst of it. I think that, that we're going to see much worse economic fallout in the West. And as happened with World War One in particular, there are you know people in the ruling class who think a war is the only way to get us out of it, and the only way to, you know, they don't think they can compete anymore with China, and which is true, or they cannot economically compete with China, so they feel like they just have to blow China up. I mean, I think, and I think that there are strong elements who are pushing for that. So. Um, it, it, it appears it doesn't necessarily matter what a guy like Trump or Biden in their hearts want or don't want. And again, that was really evidence when Trump became president in 2016. He was talking about peace with Russia, getting along with Putin. He even talked about getting along with North Korea. Do you remember that? And he was so pressured into not doing those things that he backed off all those things and ended up being quite belligerent towards Russia backing out of the 1987 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Treaty, um, arming Ukraine. So um, the question is, you know, will those in the ruling class who want war, will they be ascendant? Um, and that remains to be seen. Obviously, too, it depends on will there be a peace movement to challenge that? I hope so. I hope the, the people of Gaza have definitely awakened a peace movement in the West to do that. So let's hope that that will, that will continue to exist and to grow. We have two parties in the United States. The Democratic Party is hating, hating Russia. And at the same time, they're saying China is the enemy, but let's go after Russia first. And you see the Republican Party the opposite way, they're saying Russia can be managed. We can talk with Russia, but let's go after China. It's unbelievable that whatever your choice is in the United States, you have to go pick a war with one of these superpowers. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is unbelievable. Like you said, as an American voter, your choice in the election is between which war do you want? Which war can you tolerate the most? Um, in many ways, it's always been that way. I mean, the U.S., as, as Jimmy Carter pointed out, the U.S. has been at war throughout almost in its entire, entire existence. It is a warlike nation. It was built on war against the Native Americans. Um, and 
it it seems that it's it's war is in the very fiber of its being. Um, you know, that had it manifest destiny, this idea that God gave it the right to, you know, we talk about the river to the sea in Israel, Palestine. Uh, the U.S. think God gave, you know, um, um, the Europeans the right to have dominion from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And then once they got to the Pacific, they decided they needed to even keep going, right? I mean, it, it, the the idea of U.S. expansion is well beyond any country's imagination ever, right? I mean, the 800 or to 1,000 military bases the U.S. has around the world, it dwarfs the number that any other empire has ever had. You know, they always say, well, the Romans only had like 33 international bases. The, the British only like 36. The U.S. has like 800 to 1,000. And of course, even now they want to colonize space. I mean, again, the, the lust for domination and control of the United States is boundless, literally boundless. And... Um, that is a force that needs to be reckoned with. And, and, and the, only the American people can change that, you know. And just to wrap up this session, then, do you think that with the new political changes that are happening right now in Europe, are we going to have any sort of powerful movement in Europe that could influence the policy of the United States in Ukraine or even in China, we know that European Union is not happy with the policy against China as well. Russia is their, just their, in their neighborhood, but China is a very important country when it comes to their economy, as Russia was before the conflict in Ukraine for the sabotage of the North Sea pipeline. How do you see this new movement in Europe and how is it going to influence the policy of the United States or NATO? I think, I'm not sure that they can influence the United States, but I do think they can influence NATO. I mean, I think they, in the influence they can have is to destroy NATO. I mean, I think it's in their self-interest. It's in Europe's self-interest to destroy NATO, to get out of NATO. Uh, because NATO is nothing but a, a mechanism for the U.S. to dominate Europe and to destroy their economies for the U.S.'s own benefit. We see that with the cutting Europe off from Russian natural gas, which Europe desperately needs for its economies, right? None of this is working to the benefit of the Europeans. And so I do think that ultimately, I hope sanity will prevail and Europe will decide, look, we got to go our own way. We got to We got to go away from the U.S. This is not helping us and that they will break ties with NATO ultimately, and that NATO will be gone. That has to happen. Um, it has to happen for world peace, but, but again, it has to happen for the Europeans' own survival and, and prosperity. 